welcome to the Does It Work podcast by Biomarker Labs, where you can find wellness without the woo. There's an alligator coming down. So today I'm joined by uh, Martin Cohen. He's been published in The Guardian, The Daily Telegraph, and The Independent, and is author of several books. His latest is, I Think, Therefore I Eat, which uses the great philosophers to help us think about what we should put in our bodies. Thank you so much for joining us, Martin. Uh, my pleasure, Kathy. Yeah, so I was super interested in the concept of this book. It was really interesting. Um, yeah, and you start with a very philosophical statement. Food is, vex- food is vexing. It's not even clear what it is. Um, and then you talk about soy lint a little bit, which is interesting for me since I'm in um, San Francisco where we're always tinkering with our food. And uh, the, the whole thing is it, it's just deconstruction of food, which has gone on since I think uh, must have been the... Uh, uh, 18th century where they discovered how how basically you can grow crops just using a few chemicals and um, previously we treated life with much more reverence you know they're, they're the vegetable that grew um, the discovery that you can grow it like they do in, in these modern um, agro culture warehouses under artificial light on pebbles with just a handful of chemicals and, and that sort of um, changed our way of looking at food but at the same time, although it grows a big plant, it seems that it isn't actually growing the plant with all the nutrients that a, a real natural plant will have. And we're, we're eating this sort of fake food all the time. And really, that's one of the big themes in the book is how it looks like food and it smells like food because they've added the smells, you know. <laughs> um, they've added chemicals like uh, antifreeze to the top of it to make it look attractive. Um, but it actually, inside, um, it, it doesn't seem to be re- reacting very well with our bodies at all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it, the, the part about bread and all the scary sounding chemicals in bread was really interesting to me. I was really surprised. Um, how do you, how do you as, a, as a consumer like know what's harmful and what isn't and, and how do you shop smartly? Well, well exactly. I, I mean, so... The bread example, I think, is is very simple and very uh, um, very immediate. And we we think of it as basically bread should be flour plus uh, water plus a pinch of salt and a bit of yeast. But we, if you get a modern bread, it's got twenty ingredients in it, and some of it is really weird chemicals. Um, some of it is E numbers. We've no idea what the E numbers are. Things like plaster of Paris are added to bread, and we. We just trust people to, to, you know, to make our food. But natural fact, that when you look at the evidence for it, that we sh- trust is misplaced. People are interested in money. They're not interested in health. And you, you need to really search very hard now to find anything that resembles bread as, as our grand, great-grandparents would have eaten it because it's been going on for 100 years, this fiddling with food. Yeah. It's... Something, and maybe we can talk about this later because it's a big question, but I'm a pretty, you know, uh, I'm into the idea of the free market, right? That people benefit each other by pursuing their own self-interest because, uh, you know, it spurs innovation and that people, when they trade voluntarily, both people are better off. Um, But when I think about things like food um, or like news, for example, it seems like what's best for people and what's profitable is pretty clearly at odds, at least in the situation that we find ourselves in now with like big agribusiness, you know, cutting corners to cutting corners when it comes to health to maximize profit. Um, Do you, do you think that that's true? And if it is, you know, what, what do you think the solution is? Yeah, no, I, I, I start from your position as well. But I'm very, very skeptical now. I'll give you an example of something I've been looking at, which is the vegan, the vegan diet thing. And you may have noticed all over the, the media, there's a lot of stuff now about vegan food being better for you. Um, and there's talk in the UN and, and in these big international corporations about taxing um, dairy, taxing meat, and pushing people towards vegan diets, um, irrespective of what people think. And I, I looked into this um, with a, a friend in, in Brussels, a professor in Brussels, and um, the people behind it have 
very extensive business interests in things like nitrogen fertilizer and indeed some of them have interests in, in oil. It's, it all comes back to the same old suspicious characters in fact. Very, very rich people, billionaires often, and they have the money to create big uh, websites, attractive looking websites full of healthy looking foods. They have the money to get friendly academics behind them, in fact whole universities behind them. And we need to be incredibly skeptical about everything we're getting. Yeah, I think that's very smart. I think it's very smart to be skeptical. I mean, I think we need to be skeptical just besides the whole influence of corporations and the information we get about health. The fact that for whatever reason, a lot of the things that we've been told about health turn out to not be supported by further evidence, that there's constant change in what we're being recommended to do for our health. But then that leaves us pretty in the dark. If we can't trust anything, you know, how do we make choices? Yeah, well, that was one of the things I found fascinating. That's actually sort of what started me on the food question was how, how you had for a few years a very, very extensive consensus on an issue. And the one that is perhaps most famous is the one about fat in America, um, that you have to avoid dietary fat. I, I remember my parents going on to this. They said, right, well, no more butter. We'll have margarine, you, you know, all this stuff. Um, and at the time, the government signed it up. It was all official. At the time, it was only ever really a couple of people pushing it, a couple of academics, influential figures. And they, they got the official advice changed. They got the newspapers reporting it as though every scientist agreed. And they drove out all the dissenting voices for, for quite a few years. And very slowly, academics picked it over. And they said, look, the arguments don't, don't work. For example, the famous Mediterranean diet, which is oily um, and uh, actually quite high in fat, is actually very healthy. And there was no link at all between fat and heart disease. Or if there was a link, as I'm sure you know, if there was a link, it actually went the other way. The, the, the low fat diet it was associated with higher incidence of heart disease. Have you read The Big Fat Surprise? Yeah, that's right. It's that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. And it's shocking in a way. But that's sort of what got me into it. I thought, well, what's going on? And, you know, and I'm interested in philosophy of science and how, how opinions change radically in science. But food is a very sharp example of that. It is. It's, people ask me, like, you know, do you like writing about wellness? And I do. And one of the reasons that I do is that it's surprisingly dramatic. Like there's a lot of like fights and like drama in, um, yeah. in wellness um, and in diet particularly. Uh, speaking of um, controversy, so you recommend um, diet tips straight from the horse's mouth that people graze, have lots of small meals. But research is coming out that intermittent fasting may actually be healthier for people. So um, that's getting all of your calories in a short period of time. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, well, I looked at the fasting thing and it, I spoke to, um, didn't speak, I, I, I exchanges by email with one of the researchers in this area, um, um, Walter Longo. Um, and he, he puts it all down to microorganisms and things in the gut. And it's actually extremely technical what he's arguing. It's, it's, it's beyond... Uh, normal diet, you know, it's well into the inner workings of the body. But I was left at the end of it, I was left that it's extremely debatable what he was saying. There's some truth, um, the good side is there's some truth in that when the body is starved of food, it may do things that are desirable, such as destroy cancerous cells, eat up all the old rubbish cells, you see. But equally, it's clear that when the body is not getting as much food as it wants, it actually will destroy good cells, it'll, it'll run itself down, it will damage the liver, it will damage the brain, um, the fat in the brain. Um, and it, it seemed to me that the whole idea of uh, fasting was extremely risky. Um, the compromise you might get out of it is that you could consider something like a 48 hour fast, which um, is barely enough for, for the uh, supporters because the body's only just started to change its mode at that point. But any longer than that, you, you run the risk of all sorts of unexpected things. And I put that in the book as my idea is 
it's my third principle is don't mess with the crystal vase because we don't really understand the complexity of the body. And if you do something radical with it, whatever kind of diet it is that you put yourself on, you, you are messing with the crystal vase. You, you should be very wary. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like the 16-8 um, uh, fast. So just trying to get all your calories in in eight hours. So this is maybe not helpful for uh, auto autophagy, um, but is also not a, a severe shock to the system. To me, it makes sense to give your body a break from digesting all the time. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, you're right. It's still kind of evolving the, the, the evidence behind it. Um, to some extent, I think, you know, it's what I'm saying. People should take their own individual decisions and, and they can also judge their own body's reaction. And right. what, what may work for you may not work for someone else. And that, a lot of it will depend on the bacteria in your body and the amount of the balance of fat on in your body. And, and it's, it's so complex that it would be absurd to say, oh no, that's, that's bad for me, it must be bad for you, or vice versa. But at, at the same time, I, 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 I did think with the fasting, um, it's, it's something that probably we, we are too frightened of being without food. It's almost a psychological thing. And so <laughs> I, I, I think there is something to be said for it, but only in moderation, like most sure. things in life. Absolutely. Um, one thing that I really love that you brought up in the book, um, because I see it a lot in wellness, um, is uh, the, the kind of... Um, logical fallacy maybe of the appeal to nature and how it impacts diet advice. Yeah, yeah that's right. The, 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 the attempt to, with the paleo diet to, to take everything back to how we ate um, thousands and thousands of years ago, um, which I, I found again, when you look at it, it doesn't add up. Um, that how we ate thousands and thousands of years ago is not a simple matter because people ate very differently depending which sort of tribe they were. If you were a tribe on an island, you ate a lot of fish. And if you were uh, a tribe, as they imagine, like an African one, you might have eaten a certain amount of meat, but you'd have had a great deal of trouble hunting it. And it would have been little tiny animals. And almost certainly, it's a myth, this picture of the, the caveman hunting the large beast. They wouldn't even, we, we, we know that ourselves. <laughs> I, I come from a country-ish, um, childhood and I know that I wouldn't manage to catch anything I, maybe I could have caught a sparrow in my garden I would never have caught a rabbit so we live on that myth but it's a bit of a dangerous myth and then people are saying well they're attaching a huge amount of significance to what supposedly people were doing back then even if it's true this is what you were saying really even if it's true people used to do something it doesn't follow it's a good idea Right. I mean, I liked your point about microbiota, like you can change your microbiota within a few months to years. So the, and that affects what you should yeah. eat and that affects yeah. how your food impacts your health. And so the idea that our microbiota is, you know, even similar to tens of thousands of years ago, doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind that not that, and I think it applies way bigger than the paleo diet. I think, um, for example, you know, genetically modified foods, right? There's a lot of people who are um, really uh, wary of that because they see it as, you know, natural is better. But at the same time, you have to look at the evidence and the evidence is pretty clear that genetic modification in and of itself is not harmful, um, that it can be or can't be. It kind of depends on the modification. Yeah, there I'm half with you and half not with you. In terms of modifying food, people have a bit, I agree with you, people are very silly about modifying foods because everything we eat is extremely, you know, it's been modified over thousands of years and there's almost no resemblance to the original natural foods. And of course, we're quite happy with that. The, the, it's the kind of modifications, though, that are done through um, to, to a plant expert sprinkling the pollen on, on the anthers of another plant or, or some sort of semi-natural way of mixing the, the elements of the plants together. Whereas with the GM thing is done in a laboratory. And you, this, this is what I think is worrying. It, it's creating something that in nature, again, that's what your point was, 
how, why do we put nature there? But if, if nature wouldn't allow such a species to exist, that it seems to me more problematic than a human creating something that nature hasn't created. Um, if you see what I mean by the distinction there. So th there are problems to my mind about radical um, genetic engineering and the other side of the genetic engineering is that they do splice in genes to make things, for example, pesticide tolerant. And the problem with that is that, of course, they then use vast amounts of pesticides on these plants. And so when I see G GM products, I, I, I avoid them myself. Although I agree with you that the, the notion that the it, people interfering with nature, again, is always wrong, is, is an absurdity because we absolutely our whole, whole uh, range of foods today is artificial. Right, right. And that's, yeah, that's what's problematic about using natural as a qualifier for healthy is that, you know, it's, it's not really, it's not really practical. But um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I completely agree. And that goes back to the first point about some of these modifications are made that to be profitable and are directly contradictory to people's health. And so that's where we need to be concerned, um, for sure. And I definitely agree with you that, I mean, it's just, just very clear that body weight is much more than calories in, calories out, that people's yeah. genetics and their microbiota and their, you know, uh, prescription medications they take, like all this can yeah. mean that, you know, you and I can consume the exact same number of calories and have very different BMIs. It's been a quite interesting little bit of reporting lately about you can think yourself thinner. <laughs> and it sounds, it sounds very trivial and new agey, but I think it's probably right, you see. Um, another thing about what your body does is it is all, it is, we are partly as the Descartes thing, we're partly a physical object and we're partly a mental object. And when people think to themselves, they exactly the same, but they're saying to themselves, actually, I'm getting thinner now. Apparently they do get thinner. <laughs> and it's, a, it's, it's an interesting thing because it, conversely, a lot of people who get um, their weight goes out of control. It often is coincides with a period in their life when they've got um, psychological issues. They've been very upset by something, something has happened. And they may feel bad about themselves. And so feeling bad about themselves, they begin to, the body reacts and goes awry. But, right, um, and there's, there's very good um, research. I don't know how good it is, but I've seen it multiple places um, that fat shaming actually causes people to gain more weight. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, it would. It would focus them on, on this self uh, image of themselves getting more and more fat. And conversely, this is the research is if you can think to yourself, look, I'm getting healthier and healthier each day. I feel better and better. You actually do get healthier. <laughs> it's a, a nice way to, to look at things. Certainly. Um, I am. I want you to tell me more about the story of uh, Paracelsus. Is that how you say? His oh, name? yeah. Yeah, that's near enough. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, Paracelsus. Mm -hmm. um, oh, he's, a, he's a very curious figure, um, a medieval figure, uh, who, who in a way is unattractive. He was very arrogant. Um, and it, one of his ideas was, was that you could cure things with a little bit of the, of, of, of a tiny amount of something would have a positive effect. Um, and he, he is credited with something like the, really the origins of vaccinations, um, where you give people a little bit of a disease and that stimulates the body to develop resistance to the disease without killing it. Um, apparently he did this by putting excrement in bread, <laughs> which is, you wouldn't be pleased if this was done to you, but he apparently distributed bread with little bits of excrement in it to a, villages and townspeople in Germany who at the time were dying from the Black Plague. And in this way, he saved, he saved many people and he established a principle which has been extremely valuable. Um, so uh, he, he is in a way an iconic figure, but for various reasons, um, he, he, is, he is not accepted into the pantheon. Um, he's, he's not treated with much respect even in philosophy or medicine or, or anything else. I think he is, in a way, one of our great 
great thinkers. And so a sort of great philosopher who's not, <laughs> you know, lost philosopher. So, so was the, uh, did the people know about the special ingredient in their bread? They, 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 they didn't know specifically, you see, and, mm. and they, they knew that they were having something that was supposed to be very clever from this very respected um, medical person. <laughs> like, like many of us, we don't know what's in our medicines. Yeah, well, that's true. Um, and was the was the fecal matter from someone who had black the, the plague, or from someone who was immune from the plague? But from some some it was it someone who had had the actual disease. It was giving them tiny amounts of the disease. Okay. It, today's standards, it's incredibly risky performance. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah <laughs> well and it's funny too because like i feel like we've almost gone in like too far in the other direction where there's indications that fecal transplants can help um people and yet it's very difficult to actually get one um it seems like i don't know how do you feel about the right to try the, the right to to try the right to try so the idea that people should you know if you're of sound mind like and there's a very risky and in the medical establishment's opinion uh, treatment that it should be up to you to weigh the pros and the cons and to take the risk if you want to. Uh, well, I mean, that is the general principle of, of medicine is that the patient should have be able to make you know informed consent decision. Um, there, there would appear to be a sort of economic <laughs> restraint on very risky procedures. Um, and and that someone Oh, I, can't, I can't see why people would want to, to allow a procedure which has a very low um, expectation of success. So that in that sense, you're talking about procedures which have justified themselves to some extent, aren't you? No. If it was something totally out, outlandish. <laughs> well, I think in the US, at least, it's we're too far in the direction of, you know, there is a treatment, it shows promise. Um, but it could be risky, and so their patients are not able to easily, you know, get that that um, that treatment. And yeah, I think that patients should be able to obtain it if if they think it would be helpful to them. That they shouldn't have to like prove it to like a, a whole board um, or anything like that. They shouldn't have to jump through all these hoops. Like it's your body. But, but as I say, I mean, it, it, there's the economic thing. I mean, I, I, are they getting this via some insurance scheme so they're not paying for it? It might be a very expensive drug. You, you often hear about people want the latest drug, which maybe costs $100,000 for a month or something. And they can only do that because someone else is paying. Um, and the doctors say, well, it's probably not going to work, but they insist that they think it will work. Now, I'm not really very sympathetic to the patient judging that because they haven't got the sophistication to judge that. Yeah, no, I mean, whether, whether other people should pay for it is a totally different question. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more about just the, you know, if you can pay for it yourself. So, yeah, yeah. should you have the yeah. right to well, buy it? I, I would think in, in the normal sense, then <laughs> it is your autonomy that allows you to do what you want with your body. Right, right, exactly. Hmm. Um, how would you recommend that people consume fewer plastics, antibiotics, and hormones? Um, well, we, I did a, a chapter on all the plastics that we're getting in the environment, and there was interesting research by uh, an Australian called Boyd Swinburne that was done in America, a lot of the research with um, American Indians on reserves. Um, and and he, he identified, without having intended to discover this, he identified that the reason that a lot of people had illnesses was that you seemed to be getting these kind of plastics through their environment, and particularly their food. Um, and what he identified was it, it's basically it's everywhere it's, it's in the air it's in the water and of course it's in, in actual food products so how do you avoid it well it's actually very difficult but one way you can avoid it is you you move more towards the, the sort of bio the organic foods um, another one is that you try to eat sort of fresher things and less uh, less highly processed things um, and <laughs> uh, uh, I think that it's, it's, 
it's a bit like there used to be a great scare about pesticides in the environment, which, you know, um, sort of we don't talk about that so much, but things like Agent Orange and things like this. Um, the fact is, it's, it's, it's alarming, but they, they have spread everywhere. You can't get away from these things. Um, and I, I would say that you, you, you have to be a bit worried about it. And the consequence of it is that you, where you can avoid them, you do avoid them, but you, you, you probably have to be philosophical and <laughs> accept that, like it or not, you're going to have a dose of plastic in your life. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, depressing, but probably true. Um, is there anything else that you want people to know about um, the nutrition, philosophy, and this book? Well, yeah, the, the thing that I think, having <clears throat> looked at food issues, um, that seemed to me the most important, really, is to, to, to respect your, what your body's telling you, um, and maybe respect it more than um, what what you might get from a nutritionist or, or something because the idea that advice suits everyone is probably the part of the problem um, people people should feel free to, to listen to their own body and I I, I find for example I, I, I've got a partner who eats very differently from me and my a little boy and the little boy they eat very differently and this is one of the things that annoys me is people are trying to make little children eat like grown-ups. Children have different needs and different interests. So that's really what I would say. People should literally take back control of what they're eating and they should do it on an individual basis. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's good advice. Thank you so much for coming on. So your book is I Think Therefore I Eat. Um, where can people find it and find out more about you? Well, um, the easiest place is online, although I'm hoping it will get into some bookstores. And the site that you can go to is the publisher's site, turner.com. Of course, it's on at all the other big sites as well, but turner.com gives you a choice, including independent bookstores. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much, Kathy. Have a Bye great day. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Does It Work podcast by Biomarker Labs. For links, show notes, and more, check out biomarker.io slash podcast.